Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to join us today. We at Park Ave want to be a help to you, so if you have a prayer request or a question about today's sermon, fill out the Connect card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Thanks for being back with us today. Hope you had a wonderful Easter last week. Uh, we are working our way back into our Ephesians series today, uh, Beggars No More. Uh, Paul wanted the Ephesian believers to understand the rich identity that was theirs in Christ. And uh, God worked through him to communicate that to that group of believers and has inspired and preserved these words so that they would help to instruct us in the same way. And so the big idea we've been looking at throughout this entire series, and we're not done with it yet, is that we have been given everything we need in Christ. He has made every spiritual provision. He has anticipated every need, and he has cared for it all. Now, sometimes we can't see it. Sometimes it's not the way we think we would do it but it is best for us and we can depend on him. And I know that's not always easy. In fact, it's very often not easy, uh, but we need to continue to develop our trust muscles and be able to trust him more. And that takes work, that takes practice, and we won't always get it right, but we can keep moving forward. So the first three chapters of Ephesians, uh, tell us who we are in Christ. Paul reviews again and again and again the riches of the gospel available to us and the dramatic impact that it can have in our lives. And so just to review some of the gospel content we've been looking at in the first half of this series, in chapter 2, we saw the gospel unpacked like this, uh, that we were alienated, that Christ reconciled us, and now I have secure identity. And I could not do anything about how alienated I was. I could not do anything to secure this new identity on my own, but Christ did what I could not do and brought about reconciliation uh, between God the Father and we as his uh, his created children and made this possible for us. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at this idea as part of uh, what we were looking at in chapter three, uh, that experiencing God's love is vastly superior to merely understanding it. Um, just studying about God's love can give you an, an intellectual appreciation for how much he loves us, but it's in experiencing that love, not just knowing about it, but experiencing it, that we become truly rich in our Christian walk. And that there are two extremes for us to avoid. Uh, we can overemphasize experience, and then uh, our experiences become too authoritative in our life. We give them much more credence and the Word of God and godly counsel kind of get sidelined. And uh, that can be a very dangerous way to live. Uh, it can be very unstable. It can be very unsettling uh, because we can feel like we're pulled this direction and then this direction and this, this direction. The other danger for us, though, is that we would underemphasize experience, that we would avoid it. And uh, whereas Overemphasizing experiences can end up that we're kind of erratic and all over the place. Underemphasizing experiences can uh, result in a cold, dead theology, and we don't move at all. We just sit like a bump on a log, and, and we're not making any progress forward. And so uh, moving about erratically, obviously not healthy, not the best for us, but having no forward momentum, also not good for us, not healthy. So now we move into the second half of the book of Ephesians. And while the first half emphasized who we are in Christ, the second half of the book 
essentially says, so what? What difference does that make in how I live my daily life? And so the second half of the book, beginning in chapter 4, starts to unpack that for us. And Paul first addresses life in Christian community. He addresses some things for them as a church before he addresses uh, individuals. Now, there's lots of individual instruction in these verses, but it's all given in the context, in the larger context of church life. Uh, we as Westerners tend to have a very individualistic view, and uh, that's not the way these people would have heard Paul's instruction. They were already very much accustomed to community living and what that would mean for them. So today we're going to be looking at Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. Uh, that's a longer section. I'm not going to take the time to read that all together for us, although you could certainly pause the video now and do that on your own if that would be beneficial for you, and then we'll continue to unpack it together. Uh, Paul talks about three key elements of healthy churches or of a healthy church. Um, are these the only elements? No. Uh, have they been expressed differently? Absolutely. But this is kind of the way Paul unfolds this. He talks about three areas, about uni unity, about ministry, and about maturity. And as he talks about these, you may notice that uh, it, they're not really cleanly divided. Uh, Paul didn't use this three-point outline. Uh, it flowed from one thought to another, and uh, they kind of bleed into one another. They're not clearly defined, and that's actually very appropriate because we have a habit of making things very, very distinct when, in reality, they, they affect one another, they feed into one another. If unity is not functioning correctly in the church, it will affect how they do ministry and how they move forward in their maturity. Uh, if a church is very united, but uh, is not conducting ministry, is not giving people an opportunity to serve, that is going to eventually have an impact on their maturity and will even begin to affect their unity. If one of these three things is unhealthy, uh, it's only a matter of time before the other two will be affected by that. Um, so we're going to lead off this morning looking at the area of unity in verses 1 through 6, and then we'll look at the other areas in their respective verses. So let's get started. Verse 1. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So, a couple things that I think are noteworthy here. Again, Paul mentions being a prisoner, and he mentions being a prisoner for serving the Lord. That's going to really tie into the section talking about ministry, because sometimes serving God costs us something. And Paul was not bemoaning the fact that that serving God called him something, he considered it a privilege. And that was kind of the framework with which he came at all of this. He says, therefore, which means in light of everything we've talked about before, in light of everything God has done for you, therefore, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So he begs them to lead a life worthy of their calling. Uh, we could talk about the idea of walk worthy of your calling. It's really just living your life in such a way that it, it matches what is true about you. And so uh, as we looked at those first three chapters and what is true about what God has done for us in the gospel, there should be some natural, what, what kind of person would that result in? And that's living worthy of our calling, of being in a process 
of consistent transformation. We're not going to get it all right all the time, but when we get it wrong, we, we own it, we confess it, we ask for God's help in changing, and we move forward. And when we do that, we are going to be a people who is changing, who is maturing. Oh wait, we're not getting to that one quite yet. We'll get there later. Uh, moving ahead, verse 2. He gives some practical, so what does it look like to lead a life worthy of your calling? Well, he starts to unpack that. He says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Now, we, we hit right in here, he's in verse 2, and we're already getting uncomfortable. I know I am. Uh, always be humble and gentle. Uh, that's a challenge right there that's not natural for us. Uh, be patient with, with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. I think that's powerful because we tend to be people who are very easily irritated with others and there's no excuse for the way they're behaving. But when we're doing badly, we want people to make allowances for us. We're like, well, but I didn't sleep well last night. And I haven't had lunch yet, so I'm getting hangry. And, and we want allowances given to us because we're like, well, but there's circumstances you don't understand. But guess what? We need to remind ourselves that's true for the person we're irritated with as well. And the same allowances we want to be given, we need to be willing to give because we love one another. Uh, so church is not all that different from the rest of the world in that we can get on each other's nerves. And it's imperative that we choose to be patient with one another to express love to one another. Uh, we don't wait to feel that way, we choose to act that way and then let our hearts catch up with that. And then verse three, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Notice he does not say make every effort to get yourselves united. No, God has already done the work of uniting us. We have a common bond because of the gospel. What takes effort is for us to keep ourselves united. That's not in our own strength. That's in the, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. I think that imagery is interesting because that sounds voluntary. That sounds participatory. Binding yourselves together with peace Sounds like a group of people who is coming together and saying, okay, I'm in. Are you in? Are you in? How about you? Are you in? And based on that decision, uh, joining into that unity, choosing to find expression for that unity. And I think that's powerful. So there's a couple of characteristics that Paul talks about here. I just want to pause on these and look at them together. Uh, he talks about humility, gentleness, patience, and forgiveness. Now, I think for most of us, if we're being honest, these are not easy for us and these are not natural for us. Um, a number of years ago in the Christian community, there was kind of a craze around WWJD, the idea, what would Jesus do? Uh, Thank you, Charles Sheldon. Um, and I think it's a good thing, but it's a limited thing. And one of the dangers of WWJD is that it focuses us on behavior alone and we can miss what's going on on a heart level. So perhaps a, a better choice for us would be to say, what attitude would Jesus choose in this circumstance? in this relationship, in this interaction, and that we choose to cultivate that attitude. Now, that's not going to be natural for us. 
that's a wonderful opportunity for us to invite God to help us, to acknowledge our need. God, I don't feel like being gentle right now. I need your help. I, I, I want to be like Christ. And so there's some things that Satan wedges in here very quickly and our nature accommodates them that will very naturally take the place of these good characteristics. Uh, those would be things like pride, irritation, entitlement, and bitterness. And a good practice for us not to feel guilty, but to be aware, where do I need to give God permission to work on my character, is maybe to ask this question, where has pride replaced humility in my heart? Where has irritation replaced gentleness in my heart? Where has entitlement replaced patience in my heart? And where has bitterness replaced forgiveness in my heart? Uh, those good characteristics that are modeled for us in the life of Jesus Christ, again, they don't come naturally to us. They take work and they take surrender to him. Those over in the left-hand column that Satan brings, we can do that all on our own. We've never needed a lesson. Uh, we don't need any coaching. We figure those out very easily all on our own. Um, I want to give you just a few more examples of ones that you might want to consider and you might want to pray through and just ask God, God, show me where you want to work in me. So where is preference replace service in my heart? Where is making it happen replace waiting for God in my heart? Where has my own cleverness replaced God's wisdom in my heart? And where his presumption replaced praise in my heart. Uh, these things are not a matter of just trying harder and determining, I will do better. Um, I will prove to God that I am worth it. Uh, instead, these are opportunities for us to surrender and to pursue a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ more and more. Um, we typically act like who we're spending time with. Um, if you're a parent, you may notice in your children, if there are certain kids they're spending time around, they pick up certain habits, and, and you may not be a fan of those habits. And so you may go, I uh, want to be a little more purposeful about who my kid is spending time with. Well. We need to do that for ourselves and for many of us. Uh, actually, I would say for all of us, we would benefit from more deliberate, purposeful time pursuing Jesus because as we spend time with him, he will influence our character more and more. Verse 4, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Do you notice a recurring word? Um, I, I tried to help you out there. Um, but these are things that help to bring unity. We are part of one body, uh, the church, the body of Christ. Um, there is one spirit at work in us, the Holy Spirit. There are different spirits. If you are a Christ follower, if you've received the gift of salvation and surrendered your will, then the Holy Spirit is working in you. Uh, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Uh, the hope that I have been justified, I am being sanctified, and someday I will be glorified. We share that in common. Continues verse 5. There is one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. It sounds like our God is very, very involved in the life of his creation. Uh, because he is not just creator, it's identified for us here that he is Father. He has chosen a relationship with us that is intimate, 
He has adopted us as his children, and that's powerful for us. Um, before we leave this section looking at unity, uh, just a few things to be thinking about. First of all, because of what Christ has done, there is far more that unites us than there is that divides us. That is spiritual truth. Review those last couple verses. Those are huge, enduring things. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one God, one Father. Huge, powerful things there. However, uh, I don't know, maybe you have noticed culturally in this cultural moment, a lot of disunity, uh, a lot of volatility with one another. And that is not just outside of the church, that is going on inside of the church these days. So even though this is true, Satan is, a, is the enemy of our souls. He loves division. So the more he can keep us focused on our differences, the more he wins. Um, frankly, I think we are making it an absolute picnic for Satan right now to stir up division. Uh, because we're let, allowing things that we should not be dogmatic on to make us very, very opinionated, uh, very harsh to those who may see it differently. Uh, and we're creating a lot of division where it's not necessary. Now, when it's a matter of biblical truth, yes, we take a stand. Uh, but part of taking a stand is especially when you're dealing with other believers. Have conversation. Ask some questions. Why do you see this the way that you do? I, I, I would like to understand. And then stop preparing your counter-argument and just listen to what they have to say. There's a lot of benefit for us there. Uh, moving on. We want to move on from unity to the area of ministry. And we move on there with verse 7. Um, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And we're like, gift? I love gifts. So we get kind of excited at this point. Uh, that is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. That's a direct quote from Psalm 68, uh, which is a victory psalm. So when they would go out and do warfare against another nation, against another kingdom, and they, uh, they won, there was victory. Uh, if captives had been taken prisoner, well, they would free those captives and bring them back home. But they would also have things that they had uh, seized during that victory. Uh, that might be uh, things of value, gold, uh, other things like that. Or it might be livestock, it might be food. Uh, but those would be taken and brought back and there would be a celebration. There would be gifts to the people. Uh, verse 9. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, there's some significant theology there. Uh, I want to key in on something. If Christ had stayed, I guess we would say where he belonged, seated alongside the Father in heaven, there would be no further ascending. So, because of his great love for us, Christ came to earth, was incarnated as as a human being like us, uh, he got tired, he got uh, hungry, he got injured, 
His body felt pain. And after he lived, taught, did miracles, died on the cross, he was raised again. And so he had come down and now he was going back up. And this idea that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Uh, that's a powerful image because the God who was capable of that out of love said, I will confine myself to a baby in a womb and I will be born in a smelly stable and I will do all of this out of love. But make no mistake, this is the end of the story. This is what Christ will enjoy. Verse 11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. And again, we get kind of excited because we, uh, we like gifts. Um, we think we deserve something really nice. So these are the gifts Christ gave to whom? To the church. Uh, it doesn't say to Christ's followers. It says these are his gifts to the church. And he goes from there and he says, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. And for many, you may kind of go, oh, well, that's kind of a letdown because that's not me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm none of those things. I'm just a... I'm, I'm, I'm a mere mortal. Uh, I'm not one of the super spiritual. And God gave church leaders to the church. Uh, but that's not all he gave, and that's not all the gifts. Uh, we know that from other passages of Scripture, uh, other teachings of Paul in the New Testament letters, uh, that this is not an exhaustive list. Um, so we continue, verse 12. Uh, let's take a look at that. Their responsibility, the, so the responsibility of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, their responsibility uh, to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Does that sound right? We treat that like that's right. It's not right. Let's try reading what scripture actually says. I omitted a phrase here uh, that God placed there, and I think it's really important. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Uh, often we get this mixed up and we think, well, we've hired somebody to do the work of ministry. Uh, to do the work of the church, to build it up. It's their responsibility to do all of that. And that's not what God says. It says it's the responsibility of leaders to equip God's people to do the work. Now, I am a pastor. I am also one of God's people. So because I'm a leader and in charge to equip does not uh, dismiss me from needing to also do the work. It's just not my work alone as pastor. So I hope that makes sense. We can make that distinction. So this area of ministering, this is really important for us to understand because some of us, we can refuse to serve because we're disinterested. We're too busy with other things uh, and, and we don't really want to join in. And there can be other people who are in service overdrive that are doing so much and that can be out of wonderful motives. That can be out of a sincere love for God and a love for his people and a love for his church. But unfortunately, it can also uh, uh, cater to some of the worst parts of our nature. Um, serving can be about showing off. Serving can be about getting attention. Serving can be about showing people and showing God how valuable we are in an attempt to earn our worth. And all of those are very dangerous things for us. Um, author 
Tony Morita expresses it this way, that the imperative for us to be people who begin to serve one another. He says this, uh, every Christ follower should grow up and use a towel, a tool of serving others, not wear a bib. Uh, a bib is something that babies wear. Uh, pe uh, babies are helpless. They need to be fed by someone else. They are entirely dependent. And in the church, unfortunately, many of us volitionally choose to stay babies and just sit and say, feed me, feed me, come on, feed me, instead of saying, who can I serve? Who can I help? And that's a important challenge for us. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the section dealing with ministry. Let's move on to our last section dealing with maturity. Verse 13. This will continue until we all come to such unity. So see interrelationship here. To such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Now, depending on who you are, that, that verse may hit you differently. That may inspire great optimism and great hopefulness and just be a breath of fresh air for you. Or that may sound incredibly scary and intimidating and you may feel like, uh, I don't feel like I'm making the cut because I'm not growing like that, uh, and I am struggling. Uh, I can tell you very honestly, I am in the second of those camps. I tend to see a verse like this and get a little intimidated um, because I'm like, oh, I, I need more faith, I need more knowledge, I certainly need more maturity. And this idea of measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, I feel like daily I become more aware of how far I am from that standard. Um, not feeling like, oh, I'm almost there. Um, but I want to remind us that we are on the journey. We have been justified. That's, that's Ephesians 1 through 3. Uh, we are being sanctified. That gradual change in our character that's not just up to us. It's up to us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and what he is doing. And glorification when we get to heaven that is when we will reach the full and complete standard of christ because we will then be like him no longer plagued by sin and so this is a glimpse of our future and the striving that we engage in here in the present uh, we should not be discouraged we should not feel defeated um, satan is the one who should be feeling defeated and too often we let him uh, thrust that upon us. Um, verse 14 tells us what maturity does not look like. Uh, then we will no longer be immature like children. Now, this sounds like uh, Paul is being uh, down on children. There are great characteristics of being childlike. A childlike faith but there are other characteristics that we are intended to grow out of if we get stuck in them uh, that's a sign of we're, we're not growing properly as a person so he says we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching so if every new idea sounds just as good as the last one and you're like oh yeah I believe that oh yeah that sounds good oh yeah Let's do that. Oh yeah, let's believe that. That's a childish faith, not a childlike faith. It's childish because it doesn't discern anything. It doesn't say, wait, but that doesn't match what God said here in his word. Um, and then finally, uh, this last statement feels like it was written in 2021. Uh, we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Um, that's the sign of a good lie, is that it sounds like, well, that could be true. That could be a reasonable explanation. 
Um, so that idea of Satan's best lies are just truth with a little bit of a twist. They're not way off base because we can identify those. They're the lies that are really close to being true. Verse 15. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Now, um, we talk here about we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. There's a flip side of this that I think we often forget, that if we are speaking the truth in love to one another to help someone grow, then that means we also need to be listening to the truth in love. And when someone comes to us and their concern is genuine, uh, we need to disarm our defenses and be able to hear them. Uh, and often that's not an emphasis for us here. Uh, now, this idea of speaking the truth in love, there's a danger. And the danger is that most of us, by nature, are either too much love or we're too much truth. And both of those are unhealthy for us. If there's too much love, it ends up becoming permissive. And you may pass on opportunities to speak what is true because you're like, well, I don't want to make them feel bad. I don't want to offend them. Um, we're getting along so well. I don't want there to be any disruption in the relationship. And those are all admirable things. But if the person needs to hear some truth, just having you uh, love all over them probably isn't going to help them in the long term. Uh, for others, it's way too much truth and too little love. And you may, well, everything I said to them was true. Yeah. But if you said it in such a hurtful, ugly, attacking way that instead of benefiting, now they are just, they're seeking first aid to recover from the way you treated them. Well, that's not, that's not a great accomplishment either. Uh, I am certainly someone who, who will err more on the side of too much love and not enough truth. Uh, but the reality is that we need God at work in us to help us find a healthier balance. That we don't just go, well, this is just the way I am. Uh, I tell it like it is. Uh, you can say, I'm, I, I'm naturally bent this direction toward truth or toward love, but I'm inviting God to bring, help bring balance to that. I want to be open to that. Our last verse, verse 16 says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Now, before we go on, the body of Christ, he is designed to fit together perfectly, and he makes it happen. We help maintain that unity, but we do not create it. And I think that's an important distinction for us. As each part does its own special work, ministry, it helps the other parts grow, maturity, so that the whole body is healthy, unity, and growing, and full of love. So, uh, as we come to the end of our passage, I just want to look back. Uh, there is a need for unity, for ministry, for maturity, Three marks of a healthy church. So, in wrapping things up, I want to I want to package some truth this way. See if you can follow me on this. The personal pursuit of Christ likeness feeds the communal pursuit of Christ likeness. Okay, so growing in Christ is not going to just happen by showing up at a building and sitting through a sermon and enduring it and then smiling and waving on your way out and thinking, oh, I, I was a good Christian this week. I came to church. 
There needs to be a personal pursuit of Christ-likeness in your life during the week. And then when a whole bunch of people who that has been their priority all week long come together to worship and learn together, wow, there's going to be a synergy that gets set in motion there. But if it's not an individual pursuit, it will not be an authentic community pursuit. And it won't matter who is trying to equip you and how well they are trying to equip you because you're not going to have any real interest in doing the work of ministry in following Christ's instructions. You just want to walk in, listen, and walk away. Uh, this kind of personal pursuit that then results in a community pursuit is our best defense when Satan assaults us where we are naturally the weakest in unity, in ministry, and in maturity. None of those things comes naturally to us, so it requires effort for us to get there. We have been given everything we need in Christ. So my question for us this morning as we close is that you would have some conversation with God today. And you would ask him, God, which area do you most need me, most need to work in me? Maintaining unity, using my gifts, or growing in spiritual maturity. Uh, because sometimes we can come away having a grocery list a mile long of all the things that we need to fix about us, and we walk out of church defeated. And I would rather we walk out of church, walk away from a sermon feeling mobilized, that, okay, I feel like I have an area where God wants to work on me. Now I get to cooperate with him. Uh, so these are what I'd like you to consider. And you might also consider, God, what area do you most need to work in us? As my, as my church, where do I see us being weak? And then determined to be part of the solution, be part of, I want to change in that area so we can all change more in that area. Uh, you will change your church the most by letting Jesus change you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We pray that you would lead and guide us. Uh, we can't do this on our own. It's too much. Uh, so God, would you help us to be more aware, more reflective, uh, more open to your direction and your instruction, and that we would be deliberate participants in the change you want to bring in our lives, in our hearts, in our behavior. We thank you. Uh, we thank you for the practicality of your word, and we pray that you would lead and guide us in obedience and in loving you more. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.